In societies dominated by modern conditions of production, life is presented as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Everything that was directly lived has receded into a representation. The images detached from every aspect of life merge into a common stream in which the unity of that life can no longer be recovered. Fragmented views of reality regroup themselves into a new unity as a separate pseudo-world that can only be looked at. The specialization of images of the world evolves into a world of autonomized images where even the deceivers are deceived. The spectacle is a concrete inversion of life, an autonomous movement of the non-living. The spectacle is not a collection of images. It is a social relation between people that is mediated by images. Our era accumulates powers and imagines itself as rational. But no one recognizes these powers as their own. Nowhere is there any entry to adulthood. The only thing that happens is that this long restlessness sometimes eventually evolves into a recognized sleep, because no one ceases to be kept under guardianship. The point is not to recognize that some people live more or less poorly than others, but that we all live the ways that are out of our control. In all of its particular manifestations, news, propaganda, advertising, entertainment, the spectacle represents the dominant model of life. It is the omnipresent affirmation of the choices that have already been made in the sphere of production and the consumption required by that Separation is itself an integral part of the unity of this world, and the global social practice is split into reality and image. The social practice confronted by an autonomous spectrum is at the same time the real totality which contains that spectrum. But the split within this totality mutilates it to the point that the spectrum seems to be its goal. In a world that is upside down, the true is the moment of the Considered in its own terms, the spectacle is an affirmation of appearances and identification of all the of the But it is the grasps of the spectacle as essential for it to be able to be a real indication of life, an indication of its totality is a The spectacle presents itself as a vast and accessible reality that can never be questioned. So the message is, what appears is good, what is good is good. The task and substance of the man is already effectively imposed by the monopoly of appearances, its manner of appearing without allowing it to be applied. When the real world is transformed into mere images, mere images become real beings, dynamic figments that provide the direct motivations for hypnotic behavior. The appearance of events that we have not created, of events that others have in fact created against us, now obliges us to be aware of the passage of time and its results, to assess the transformation of our own desires into events. What differentiates the past from the present is precisely its out-of-reach objectivity. There is no more should be. Being has been consumed to the point of ceasing to exist. The details are already lost in the dust of time.
we remain outside of it. The relationship really is just another strength point. We are separated from it by our own thought and dimension. And end up being rather disappointed in ourselves. At what moment this choice goes wrong? When did we miss our chance? We haven't found the opportunity. We've let things slip away. I have let time slip away. I have lost what I should have defended. Ideas improve. The meaning of words plays the role in that improvement. Plagiarism is necessary. Progress depends on it. It sticks close to an author's phrase, exploits his expressions, deletes a false idea, replaces it with a right one. The unreal unity proclaimed by the spectacle masks the class division of the line of the of the capitalist and the production. What obliges the producers to participate in the construction of the world is also what excludes them from it. What brings people into relation with each other by liberating them from the local and national limitations is also what keeps them apart. What requires increased rationality is also what nourishes the irrationality of hierarchical exploitation and repression. What produces society's abstract power also produces its concrete lack of freedom. The point is to actually participate in the community of dialogue in the game with time that up till now have merely been represented by poetic and artistic works. When art becomes independent and paints its world in dazzling colors, a moment of life has grown old. Such a moment cannot be rejuvenated by dazzling colors, it can only be evoked in memory. The greatness of art only emerges at the dusk of life. The history that threatens this twilight world could potentially subject space to a directly experienced time. Real revolution is this critique of human geography through which individuals and communities could create places and events commensurate with the appropriation no longer just of their work, but of their entire history. The ever-changing playing field of this new world and the freely chosen variations and the rules of the game will regenerate a diversity of local scenes that are independent without being insular. And this diversity will in turn revive the possibility of authentic journeys, journeys within an authentic life that is itself understood as a journey containing its whole meaning within itself. <laughs>
really describe this era, it would no doubt be necessary to show many other things. But what would be the point? The point is to understand what has been done and all that remains to be done, not to add more ruins to the old world of spectacles and memories. The only interesting venture is the liberation of everyday life, not only in a historical perspective, but for us, right now. This project implies the withering away of all the alienated forms of communication. The cinema, too, must be destroyed. Out of a practical communication between those who have recognized each other as possessors of a unique present, who have experienced a qualitative richness of events in their own activity, and who are at home in their own era, arises the general language of historical communication. Those for whom irreversible time truly exists discover in it both the memorable and the threat of oblivion. Here I present the results of my research, so that time will not abolish the deeds of men and women.